open. I was thinking about some programs. Uh, one that might be interesting would be to have some members uh, present on uh, operating under restricted conditions. So if you have antenna restrictions or power restrictions, using stealth antennas, indoor antennas, might have some people with some uh, interesting perspectives on that. That's a good idea, yeah. Yeah, I might send out a solicitation to see who would want to uh, talk about that. Uh, Brian, are, are you in a restricted area for antennas? You're muted. Yeah, <laughs> yes, I am. We have a, um, uh, any any change at all to the exterior of the house that's basically visible, you have to get approved by the uh, the architecture committee. Oh boy. Um, the paints you're allowed to use on the exterior, the um, kind of a door you can have, the color of the door in the front of your house. Um, it's all got to be approved. Can you put up a flagpole? Because a 33 foot flagpole makes a nice 40 meter uh, vertical. Yeah, there are restrictions on flagpoles. Um, there's um, restrictions on, there's a prohibition on having, if you have a dog, those little door, doggy doors that let the dog go in and out of the house through a, uh, one of those openings that closes on its own, mm -hmm. that's forbidden. Um, Even on the back of the house? Nowhere, nowhere in the house at all. Um, the, um, they have to allow um, um, the satellite TV antennas because that's a state law that supersedes all uh, local covenants and conventions. The, the um, big companies got that one through. <laughs> Sounds like that's what hands need is a state law that allows you to put antennas up. There you go. Well, there's one one uh, federal law that's supposed to give hams um, at least some leverage in uh, getting antennas up with um, uh, fair accommodations, but that never passed Congress. Oh well. I mean, cams can't even operate on uh, their uh, radios in a car now because the provision that allowed hams to operate was taken out of the, the bill. I thought they, However, this, is the, this is about the fourth time they tried that, so I wouldn't worry about it too much because yeah. I see people holding onto their cell phones up to their ears all the time. So I'm going to get a microphone that looks like a cell phone. <laughs> Then you'll be safe. Yeah. Well, I've got a hands free in my car. Well, almost free. I still have to have the push to talk, but I have it on a wire that I could just uh, use my thumb. So I could actually have both hands on the wheel. And then I have I have the little microphone. I have it just hanging from the uh, from the ceiling. So right the uh, hands free are allowed. You just can't have anything that requires you to touch it. in violation jeremy so yeah the people do violate the rules um but they can be stopped by a police officer and cited well i thought they took that provision oh, well, he gets on his microphone and calls the station right yeah <laughs> well he, yeah but who's gonna give him a ticket <laughs> yeah and they've made exceptions for commercial operators Okay, so a commercial operator using a unlicensed CB radio is that's okay. Um, 
no training required or anything. Just hang a sign on the side of your truck and you're okay. So if, like Bob, you have a, a Bob, yeah, Bob's here. Uh, yeah. He has a truck that he uses for business so he can get away with it. But if you don't have that, you know, <laughs> Jeremy's contractors <laughs> on your side of your vehicle, you can't operate a handheld radio inside your vehicle. I swear we got it. I thought we got an exemption for that in the in the bill. It, it was in the original draft, but it was taken out. But then there was a second. Take it out of that too. Did, did this just happen very recently? <clears throat> the, the last I heard was the bill they were considering died in the last session. So at the end of 2020, and they were considering bringing it up again, but I don't know what happened since then. Yeah, I don't know. There's no ham lobby. Yeah. Basically, we just need a lot of money. I'll wait another minute or two and then we'll get started. Yep, Usually we got a couple of folks following on uh, YouTube as well. Oh, so yeah, my live yeah so jeremy can a non-mark uh member access the youtube uh videos oh, yeah. of various meetings yeah anybody can okay the youtube is open for anybody who has the link it's a, might links, be a are, links are on the website also <clears throat> all right should we uh get started then we uh Works for me. Do we have a quorum? No, we do. Hi, Brian. All right. Well, welcome, everyone, to the uh, May 2021 meeting of the Mid Atlantic Amateur Radio Club. So uh, we're continuing with the virtual meetings for now, but we do have some uh, summer events which will be coming up. I think they'll be uh, quite interesting. So uh, to get started, uh, unfortunately, over the past month, uh, two of our MARC members have become silent keys. Uh, Denise, uh, KB3ANO, and Doug, NE3U. They were both uh, longtime members of MARC. Uh, Denise was very involved in our public service events, and Doug had been serving most recently as our member at large. I ask that we uh, please observe a moment of silence to remember Denise, KB3ANO, and Doug, NE3U. Thank you. So I'm Jeremy uh, N2ZLQ, uh, the club president. So as we uh, normally do, let's go around with uh, a round of introductions. Uh, probably no reason to call special groups. So let's uh, first come, first serve. Bob N3JIZ. Ryan AA3BK. Dennis K3DS. Jim, W3JNF. Barry, 2, K3, EUI. Great, thanks. Uh, Lou isn't here today, so I don't have a uh, treasurer's report. But uh, Jim is here. Do you have an update from uh, membership services and an update on field day? I, I do not have an, uh, an exact number on the uh, membership, but it, we're in the mid-70s. Mid it hasn't uh, changed that much. Uh, like to see it to get into the 80s, but uh, that's going slowly. Uh, as far as field day, uh, that's scheduled for the 26th and 27th of the uh, of June. Uh, it's it, it 
it's going to be a little toned down from last year or for two years ago, actually. But, uh, you know, we're, we're hoping for a good turnout. Uh, we're going to have, uh, we're going to run uh, two alpha uh, and a Goda and, you know, just wire antennas this year. I think that's what we uh, are going to stay with, make it simple, because we don't want a lot of people climbing on roofs and climbing all over each other because of the social distancing. Mm. Uh, hopefully the rules will be more relaxed by then. Uh, it'll also be a good test for uh, the ham fest. We'll see where we're at at that point. So other than that, uh, that's all I have on field day at this point. All right, thanks a lot, Jim. And we will be having a, uh, sort of a meeting uh, in June on the fourth Tuesday in June, and we'll be talking about planning for uh, field day as well as the ham fest. Because obviously a lot of these uh, COVID things are changing kind of week by week, so it'll be good to have uh, a last minute uh, follow up. And for those who can't make it uh, to field day at Lower Providence, uh, you will be able to participate from home. <clears throat> the ARRL will be continuing the 2020 rules about uh, home stations, one deltas, being able to work uh, one another and also combining your score with uh, a club score. So we may be able to work out uh, some of that as well. All right, so let's go to uh, public service. Uh, Bob, and you can also talk about the ham fest. Okay. Um, yeah, we have a public service event uh, coming up finally, and it's coming up rather fast. Uh, it's gonna be the Radnor Memorial Day uh, parade public service event which occurs on Monday May 31st and uh, we're going to meet uh, at eight o'clock in the morning in the micro center parking lot um, it uh, promises to be probably a, one of our most fun events because it's a parade and uh, we're looking forward to uh, trying out a new simplex uh, repeater which will hopefully help us uh, communicate better and more clearly in the, uh, the RF hash of uh, Route 30 <laughs> that the parade marches on. Um, so uh, anyway, uh, and if anyone would like to uh, sign up, uh, just give me a call. My number is uh, area code 610-420-1500. That's 610-420-1535. And uh, we hope, hopefully, we'll have a great uh, great morning. Um, it, we should probably have everything wrapped up by around 1130 or, or 11 o'clock, 1130, somewhere in that ballpark. And uh, so anyway, uh, we're hopefully looking for more, more people to sign up. We could definitely use the help. And uh, so that's, uh, that's our, our public service event for the spring season, our one and only <laughs> public service event. And as for Ham Fest, yes, we're gonna have a Ham Fest and that's gonna happen on uh, Saturday, July 17th. And um, we're gonna be uh, looking for uh, help with that. If anyone would like to uh, let me know uh, if they could help out with that uh, with, with the ham fest, uh, there's a lot of different, uh, jobs for, you know, to, to be done both on the setup day of, uh, July, Friday, July, uh, 16th. And, uh, also on the day of the ham fest, uh, Saturday, July 17th. And we're going to, uh, start a little bit early, uh, to do our setup. We're going to start at three o'clock in the afternoon. Um, so if anybody is available uh, in the early afternoon, that'd be great. And so, uh, uh, like I say, there's a whole lot of different uh, different things that uh, you could do to uh, help help the club out with that. And if you're, uh, you know, only can help on Friday, that's great. If you can only help clean up on Saturday, that's great too. And if you know if you're going to be around for the ham fest. Uh, uh, that's, uh, that's super also. So, um, anyway, so once again, if anybody wants to, uh, uh, indicate that they want to help out or have any questions about the ham fest, uh, they can call me at 
420-1535 or uh or if, if there's time during the meeting or or one of the nets you can uh talk to me then also so there you go all right thanks bob uh, bob's been doing a great job with uh, public service and the ham fest those are two of our uh bigger job so bob has really uh taken on quite a bit of uh responsibility okay so uh next up uh technical services the dentist do you have anything to report well as we said last month uh three six is back on the air running about uh eight or ten watts to the antenna uh no courtesy tone just a cwid or it's a dr dr1x uh, repeater that's now basically on the back burner because the current um issue is to spend some time with Paoli. I'll be doing that over the next couple of weeks. I haven't been to Paoli site in probably four or five years myself. So we want to get the uh, uh, DR1 uh, repeater out of there and the DR1X in there and then try to interface it so that it is a cross-link repeater at least at Paoli. And I think that will be going forward what we're going to do. And then uh, we're also considering uh, purchasing some more equipment for Darby. Uh, 220 and 440 is taken care of, but 220 repeater, and we're still looking around for a good replacement for two meters. A little bit of a disappointment because the uh, Kenwood TKR 750, which we bought in 2009, bought two of them, is no longer being made. So march of progress. I'm trying to evaluate whether we want to go with Kenwood's replacement, price performance wise, or, or look somewhere else. We'll see. That's it. All right, thanks, Dennis. Yes, it's good to have uh, Darby back on the air and hopefully it'll be uh, back up uh, fully before long. So if you haven't been on the 147.36 repeater recently, uh, you can check that out. Uh, it's 147.36 and a PL of 131.8. Uh, it's located uh, down in Darby, so it makes a nice uh, complement to our uh, 06 and 13 system. Uh, in particular, uh, good coverage in the city of Philadelphia. Great. Thanks, Dennis. I'll give a little brief report about uh, nets. So our club nets are happening on the 06 and 13 repeaters on Wednesdays and Sundays at 8.30 p.m. We're typically averaging about 10 to 15 uh, check-ins, so it's a nice uh, conversational net. Uh, you're not dealing with uh, pile-ups to get in. Uh, there's normally a uh, topic of discussion. We have a couple of uh, really good uh, net control operators. Uh, we've also uh, more recently been having an informal uh, drive time uh, roundtable. Uh, that's Mondays through Fridays around uh, 4 o'clock to 4.30. Uh, no net control or set topic for that. Just uh, join in and uh, just join into the group and uh, take turns uh, talking about what's going on. All right, so that's uh, nets. So I will be out of town for uh, part of the month of June with some uh, family responsibilities. But uh, Herb, K3YR, who's one of our net control operators, he'll be minding the store for a while, and I'm sure we'll have some uh, great nets. Uh, a few other nets to look for. Uh, the Philmont Club, uh, one of our sister clubs, they have a drive time net Monday through Friday at 5 p.m. That's on the 147.03 repeater. And the Marple Newtown Club, I guess our other uh, sister club, they meet every single day, 8.30 a.m., on the 147.195 uh, repeater in uh, Newtown Square. That's on the same tower as our 06 repeater. All right, so uh, before we move on to the main program, does anyone have any other announcements uh, for the club? All right, well, I've been looking forward to this uh, presentation for a while. Uh, last month, uh, Barry gave a presentation on the Nano VNA, and inspired by that, I went out and bought the Nano VNA. You can get this on Amazon for a little over $100. Uh, comes with a nice evening bag, uh, great for accessorizing. I think it's uh, Louis Vuitton, uh, or maybe not quite, but uh, really nice device. So I've been playing around with that a little bit, uh, checking some of my antennas. But, uh, Did you say 100 bucks? About 120 128 something like that there's a lower price one but yeah i got the slightly more expensive one has a bit of a bigger screen it also has a metal case and it has n-type connectors instead of sma ah okay all right so i guess uh, without further ado uh 
our evening's invited speaker is uh, Barry Fearman, uh, K3 EUI, and he's going to lead us on part two of uh, using the nano VNA. So take it away, Barry. Okay, thank you. Good evening, all. Um, well, I was working on this about 15 minutes ago, trying some things I'd never tried before. Uh, so this is really, what's the expression? I'm into the weeds tonight and a little bit, well, maybe more than a little bit out of my comfort zone, but we'll give it a go among friends. <laughs> so let me turn on screen share. See which one I've got here. Did that come up? Looks like it. I do slideshow You're there. from current slide. Okay. That looks good. And my audio okay? Well, yeah, it's good. All right. All right. All right. So thank you again for the invitation. Uh, this is a lot of fun for me as a retired teacher. I love learning about things that I hadn't had time to learn about while I was fully employed at a boarding school. Uh, very little free time uh, working uh, with uh, teenagers, especially the boarding aspect. So um, there's so much I've learned about this in the last month or two. Um, I want to do just a quick, quick recap. Uh, the little nano VNA itself is quite versatile, but I found I uh, really started to enjoy using it and learning about it once I found the computer software that would run it. I didn't have to squint and try to read the small screen. Um, yeah, Jeremy just mentioned he has one with a larger screen that's probably a little easier. And it's a touch screen, but you have to be really careful what you poke on there. So Nano VNA Saver is the Windows 10 software I picked up, uh, well, almost a year ago. I've had this almost a year now. And uh, it does everything well, and it's free. And people have been asking me, have you downloaded the latest firmware? And I have to say, no, it does everything I want now, and I'm afraid I'm going to mess up. And I don't want to mess it up and you know get into the oh my firmware didn't update right blah 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 but i'm sure these things will improve as the hardware and the software talk to each other a little better so one of the things you can do is you know use it to play with antennas but the first talk i i gave uh it was just a month ago right it was more about uh how you can look at it for uh, examining the transmission through property of this to look at filters bandpass filters band stop filters measure lengths of coax, measure attenuation coax. Then I got to the antennas part, and I sort of ran out of steam and ran out of time. So, uh, of course, to measure an antenna, you're not measuring what comes out of the antenna. Hopefully, that's RF. But you can measure what on the feed line doesn't radiate and comes back. So there's a lot of information on what reflects the electrical property of the uh, reflection and the... Uh, impedance mismatch perhaps between the feed line and the antenna. So this thing measures very accurately and very easily resistance, reactance, impedance, phase, 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 phase. That's important. And last time I didn't get to talk about uh, reflection coefficient and return loss and really didn't say too much about what SWR is indicating and barely, barely touched on the Smith chart. So this is like this is, oh, I hate to say, it's like the grown-up talk now. I'm, I'm moving into the uh, more sophisticated aspects of this thing. And I'm a little out of my comfort zone, so we'll try it anyway. All right, so um, I ended last time saying, well, if you saw a Smith chart of a typical 80-meter antenna, and it was just this curlicue thing, would you know anything about how to interpret? And if you've ever looked at Smith charts and tried to learn to read them, um, it's it's quite an art, um, but basically it's an impedance graph. That's all it is. It's looking at uh, resistance and reactance, and depending on how you calibrate it, can tell you a lot of things. The other important thing I had to learn about or relearn about was what does phase mean on a feed line? Uh, why is there this thing phase? Well, if the SWR is perfect, then you don't have to worry about phase and resonance and resistance and anything. You just you know hook it up to your radio and you work the world. So this is a typical phase graph. And I said, well, something unusual is happening here. So we got to learn to see what is, is, is happening at this location. And this is an angle measurement. 
So the phase is really saying, you know, the voltage and the current are in phase only right here. Why right there? Well, that's the resonant frequency of this particular 80 meter dipole, about 3600 kilohertz. I'm not saying it doesn't work if you QSY up and down the band, but there's something unique happening right here, and uh, that's like the ideal operating point. And then I showed this slide and said, you know, I, I understand what resistance and reactance means, but what does it mean with respect to an antenna? What resistance do we hope to get? What reactance? The reactance is red, the resistance is blue. And we kind of just briefly, briefly said, well, with 50 ohm coax, I want my impedance to be 50 ohms. Well, what does that mean? Well, essentially, I want the resistance to be 50 and the reactance to be zero. <laughs> that means everything is like perfect. And the blue is my, uh, is my resistance, resistance, and the scale is zero to 60, so 50 is about here. So marker two, that's uh, 3.6 kilohertz, uh, 3.6 megahertz. Marker two is just about where the, the coax and the antenna are about 50 ohms each. That's good, means maximum power transfer happens there. Now, I'm not saying, again, it won't work on other frequencies, but that's like the ideal. What's the red graph doing? Well, I look at the red. Here's position two, but it's a different scale. I go over here, and it's like three degrees. Well, it's pretty close to zero. So the, the red is actually telling me almost, I'd say, more than the blue. The reactance is zero, or close to it, here, and the resistance is 50 ohms, and that's perfect for coax. 3,600, that's where I like to operate. You know, I gave this talk a couple of weeks ago to a different club, and the question kept coming up again and again and again in different ways. Does the antenna itself need to be resonant in order to work well? And the answer is clearly no. <laughs> um, it helps if you're using coax and you don't have an antenna tuner to be able to have a nice flow of power, which means uh, maximum power occurs when your system's impedances match. But no, if you operate off the resonant frequency, you can correct for that uh, most often, even in your shack. So this is one way, you know, hams do it. They put in some kind of antenna tuner, whatever the heck that means. They put up low loss balance line rather than coax. This is actually cheaper than coax. And just a long wire, you know, something string in a tree, uh, maybe 100, 200, 300 feet long, something, you know, not five feet. Um, and this antenna tuning unit can make this sort of a general purpose work, uh, antenna work on 80 through 10 meters easily. And as long as this antenna tuner unit is working properly and you don't have you know, so much power that you're burning it up, this is a cool, easily way, easy way to set it up with one basic horizontal antenna. Um, very easy to set up and easy to uh, manage. So, a typical antenna has some sort of a tuning unit somewhere, and you can put it down here and twiddle with the knobs in your shack, or you could put it up at the antenna feed line junction, but then you have to waterproof it, get power to it. Uh, it has to be able to tune automatically because you don't have arms that are, you know, 60 feet long. And uh, typically, you know, this is, this is a, a nice all-around uh, antenna. Uh, I heard a lot about NFEDs. I have had less than perfect success with my NFED half-wave antennas. I kept getting RF in the shack. <laughs> uh, but any, any wire thrown into a tree will work reasonably well on the HF bands if you have a tender tuner working against ground. That's a little trickier. So that's about where I ended the part one, and the last couple of minutes was sort of rushed there. So I thought, well, let's go back and kind of revisit some of the, uh, what's the, when they call it in QSD, the under the hood stuff. Uh, sometimes you can drive a car and never look under your hood and you're fine, you get around and, uh, and some people like to uh, open a hood and see what's there and tinker with it, get into trouble too. So, so a Smith chart, let's take a look at a Smith chart with respect to looking at antennas. I came across this because uh, a good friend of mine from Chester County has this and uh, I got to play with a little bit and um, I would love to have it <laughs> and learn how to use it. Uh, a Smith chart slide rule. Uh, I'm not going to say more about this, but you know, oh so retro here. 
So what's a Smith chart? Well, you know, we've all looked at graphs. The graphs are usually rectilinear XY graphs. What if you plot reactance on the vertical axis and resistance on the horizontal axis? Okay, that's pretty easy to do, and I'll, I'll show you an example of a uh, resistance reactance of an 80 meter dipole in that plot. But along comes this guy, uh, Smith, in what, uh, Dennis, I think it was the late 1930s, and uh, he figures out a different approach, and that is he converts this uh, XY, or rectilinear coordinate system, to a polar coordinate system. Wow, well, if you've never looked at polar graphs, this is like, wait a minute, what's going on here? So the reactance axis, instead of being vertical here, kind of wraps around. So I didn't make up this. It was a nice uh, display from Agilent Technologies. Let me give them credit. Thank you for a gorgeous uh, image here. So we're wrapping the reactance around. And when you get to this point, resistance is still the x-axis. Zero is still on the far left, like uh, most xy graphs. And to the far right is real high number, like infinity ohms. We're talking about ohms. But in the center, you can calibrate it to anything you want. And I always calibrate it to 50 ohms. Why 50? Well, most antennas are designed for 50 ohms because coax is 50 ohms. So, okay. But there's nothing magic, really, about the number 50 other than manufacturers have settled on that as a standard. Okay. So we're going to look into this a little more deeply here. So when we look at the x-axis, the horizontal axis, 0 is in the far left. Now, when I buy these uh, Smith chart uh, papers, right in the center it says 1.0, because that's just an easy way to say that's the prime, 1.0. I can make that anything I want using the VNA. So I make that 50 ohms. I'll show you how I do that. But it's not a linear graph. It doesn't go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. It goes 0, okay, 10, 25, 50, 100, 200. You see it's geometric progression here. And there's a reason for that. Now, I'm not going to, at the moment, worry about what's up here and what's down here. Let's just concentrate on the horizontal axis. If I have an antenna, and it's just a resistance, no reactance, and I get my nano VNA and you know plot it, it's going to be somewhere on this line, hopefully close to the bullseye, because the bullseye is 50 ohms, and I'm assuming we're using 50 ohm coax. I'm going to assume that for the night. So are we OK so far? A Smith chart, the horizontal axis, pure resistance. Okay, so in the center, 50 ohms, if I have any resistance and reactance, that 50, where's my cursor here, that 50 is going to start to wrap around up here if I have inductive reactance, and drop down here if I have capacitive reactance. Now, I haven't defined inductive and capacitive yet. I'll do that in a minute. But if your antenna has a phase issue, if the voltage and current are no longer in phase, working together at the feed line, then you'll get some sort of a uh, mismatch because you have a reactance. Okay, so that's bullseye. How about over here, 10 ohms? Well, 10 ohms resistance would imply anything along this circle. And as I have more and more reactants, it moves greater and greater distance away from the x-axis. So here's the reactance curves. When you look at those, it's a little like, whoa, what's going on here? Zero reactance is the horizontal, because that's just a re So this is zero ohms reactance. We're in ohms, remember. The whole thing's in ohms. 10 ohms reactance plots here. 10 ohms reactance, and anywhere along that blue line. So anywhere along here is 10 ohms reactance. Here's 25. J, oh, the J just indicates um, the other, the reactance. 25 ohms, 50 ohms. Now this is 50 ohms reactance. 100 ohms, that sounds like it's bad, right? 200 ohms. Well, remember, my ideal is the bullseye. 50 ohms resistance, no reactance. But here's what reactance is doing. And you see the circles are getting tighter and tighter circles here. That's if it's inductive. If it's a capacitive-like circuit, your antenna is behaving more like a capacitor. Then the reactance goes down in this direction, 10 ohms. And that's referred to as a negative in the way of uh, how, as you increase the frequency, the capacitive reactance decreases. There's a reason for that. Capacitors behave very well for very high frequencies, and they tend to obstruct low frequencies. So this is the hard one. I did have a, a Smith chart made up, just you know, with with uh, you know hand-drawn ink. It had the resistance and reactance. I think you can see here. 
the resistance and the reactance, they're always going to be perpendicular to each other. Okay, so plot a, a couple of random numbers here. So here's 10 plus J25. What does that mean? The 10 means 10 ohms resistance. The plus 25 means 25 ohms reactance. Plus is above, negative below. So that would plot as one point here. My antenna might be this one location at one frequency. I might have an impedance of 10 plus J25. All right, what if it's 5 plus J50? It just plots at a different location. 5 ohms, that's not very much if my coax is 50, right? This would be more like a, uh, a small hamstick on 80 meters. In fact, it, they're very close to this. Uh, that's way up here. Remember, I want to be in the bullseye. So if my antenna is plotting here, I'm thinking, man, I got a job. I got to move the uh, antenna impedance down to the bullseye. 50 plus J50, well, that's a common one. So 50 ohms resistance, that's good. That's the bullseye. But whoops, it moves up here to J50. So that's kind of interesting. As you get more and more reactants, you get farther around and farther from the bullseye. Now again, um, I can ship you the PDF slides of all of these, so don't try to copy anything down or photo the screen or something. I'll send you everything. So down here is the equivalent, 10 minus J25, 10 ohms resistance, 25 ohms reactance. It's capacitive though. The reason why the capacitive and inductive are important is to correct the mismatch, you gotta know which way you wanna move. You don't want to make your situation worse. So we okay with where reactance plots? If there's any questions, please unmute your mic and call that out because I'd rather deal with a, a question while it's on the screen. At the end of the talk, you kind of forget everything, or at least I do. Oh, it's, it's not total reactance. Um, not, it's not total impedance. It's the combination of the two. Yes. Oh, mind? yes, yes, yes. That's a good comment. Yeah, I misspoke there. So this is plotting resistance and reactance as a point on a polar graph. If you want to find the impedance, oh, well, that's good. Let's put that off for a minute. How do you find the impedance? Well, it's easy if it's just a resistance because the impedance is the resistance. It's easy if it's just a reactance. It's not so easy if it's a combination of R and J. Yeah, we'll come back to that. that that's a good point. So this is... Uh, Indirectly, it's an impedance plot, but it's really plotting resistance and reactance, yes. So, all right, keep in mind, I want to be in the bullseye, 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 bullseye. Why? Because I want to match my transmitters 50 ohms to the coax 50 ohms to the antenna 50 ohms. Bullseye, bullseye, bullseye. I can be off a little bit, and I'm happy, but I want to stay. I don't want to miss the target, right? Okay, so now, when I get out my VNA, and Jeremy has one, and some of you have one, uh, what does it actually measure and what does it figure out? That's important to know. What's it actually measuring? Well, let's revert back to the kind of the schematic here. We have a source, a little transmitter. It's only like a milliwatt. It sends out a, uh, an RF wave on the cable. You provide the cable and it goes to something, a device under test. Now, in our case, uh, that's going to be essentially an antenna. If all the energy doesn't get converted into an electromagnetic wave, that means we've got a little mismatch and something's coming back on the feed line. RSWR is not one-to-one. -one. Okay, no big deal. Um, when that voltage comes back, this gadget in here, this is really clever, this coupler, it can separate the voltage going one way and the voltage going other way and compare them, compare them as a ratio. Um, now, what do you want to come back from your antenna? Oh, that's easy. Nothing. I don't want any voltage. I don't want any energy, energy coming back. I want to radiate it all. So the more voltage, the higher the voltage you get coming back towards the VNA from the pulse, then you kind of figure, well, that's not so good. And I want to figure out how much and how to correct it. So that's what this little gadget can do. It figures out whether your uh, reflected energy is at a phase in the positive or the negative sense how much it is, and sort of indirectly, if you can read it correctly, how are you going to correct this? It's not an antenna tuner, but it certainly can tell your antenna tuner how to tune it up, it meaning your antenna. All right, so here's another slide. I didn't make it up from Agilent. Uh, this company is fantastic. I mean, at least their slides are fantastic. I think their equipment is too. So what it measures directly is called a reflection coefficient. Reflection coefficient, that's a fancy word. Well, reflection, I know what that means. Something's coming back. Coefficient just means it's a, it's a number. 
So in the, in the surface, it's, it's very simple. It's looking at a voltage one way and a voltage in the other way. But what it's based on is the fact that we're looking at impedances. And if you look at it as a ratio of reflected voltages, that's one way to view it. Uh, I've had two engineers tell me they like to look at it as a ratio of impedances. Now, wait a minute. Impedances. All right, I think I know what that means. When you divide one complex number by another complex number, it's like, oh, man, I forgot how to do that. That's higher level math and algebra one there. But essentially, if you just take the absolute value of the reflection coefficient, that's easy. Then you don't worry about all the fancy math. You get a number, okay? The number is anywhere from 0 to 1. Well, that's easy to deal with. I don't have any, you know, complex numbers there. 0 to 1. All right. Return loss is based on reflection coefficient. Oh, well, that means it's, you know, calculated from that. And it's the number negative 20 times the log of rho. Log, uh, logs, logs, logs. So if you're okay with how you take a log of a number, and you know the software engineers teach their VNAs how to do this, you come up with num another number, but this one's measured in decibels. So return loss, which hams never, I've never heard a ham, turn, a ham talk about return loss. The engineers use return loss. Return loss, it's in decibels. And it can be zero, it could be uh, 60 decibels, uh, uh, but it's based on rho. Rho is just zero to one. Okay, hams like SWR, why? Oh, probably because when I was a kid, I could buy these meters that were mostly sold in the CB, you know, shack things. And it told you how good your antenna was in SWR units. So I learned what it was. But at some point, I got curious and I opened an SWR meter and looked at the parts inside. And I thought, wow, that's pretty simple. Why did they charge me 50 bucks for this thing? That's a good question. So SWR is what hams seem to be more comfortable with, but it's fundamentally based on looking at, again, uh, voltages or powers in one way or another. And it can be computed, if you know rho, by a simple formula. 1 plus rho divided by 1 minus rho. Okay. So if you look at rho, 0 is perfect. Nothing's reflected. 0 is also a return loss of real, real big. I mean, infinite, real big, you know, like 50 dB. And SWR is 1, or we call it 1 to 1. On the other direction, what if rho is 1? It's like, no, 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 everything's coming back. My antenna isn't working. The reflection loss is 0. You didn't lose anything. Remember, I want to lose a lot coming back. And the SWR is like infinite. <laughs> when it gets 3, my radio gets cranky. I don't, I don't like infinite. So here's the relationship between the three. So again, in just simple terms, uh, rho, 0 to 1. Reflected voltage over forward voltage. I want it to be zero. Nothing's reflected. As it gets closer and closer to one, I get more and more concerned. Rho. Return loss. Negative 20. Why negative? Oh, it's negative because log of rho is negative. The log of a number from zero to one is a negative number. So a negative number times negative 20 gives you a positive number. So the, re the engineers really bite at me. Uh, Hey, Barry, return loss is a positive number. Don't plot it as negative 80 dB. But I'm holding out a little bit. Um, SWR, 1 plus rho over 1 minus rho. Well, that's easy to figure out. What if rho is 0? That's ideal. 1 plus 0, 0. Uh, 1 plus 1 is 1. 1 minus 0, 1. 1 over 1. 1 over 1 is 1. I can do that in my head. So the ideal is an SWR of 1 and a rho of 0. That's the ideal. So a quick chart. I know a lot of my antennas, the SWR is about two and nothing wrong seems to happen. Nothing smokes. I can work the world. So evidently an SWR of two is okay for my radio. What does that mean over here? Oh, by the time this voltage gets to my antenna, 30% is reflected back. I'm losing, uh, somehow losing, 30, about 30, one third, 30% 30 of my voltage is coming right back at me. Uh, but hey, I'm still working the world. so. I don't like it, but it seems to work out okay. Simple formulas between the two. This is, I mean, I made this spreadsheet up myself. When you get to an SWR of three, often the radios today start to balk. They uh, fold back the power. They say, no, no, no. I know the Kenwood radio start beeping at CW. Did it, da 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 Did it, da da SWR, SWR, you know. Uh, something bad is about to happen. And half the voltage is coming back. That would be a quarter of your power, right? So that's not good, especially uh, if you're trying to, you know, 
get a contact and suddenly your SWR is making your radio fold back or stop working. Okay, so a question then, yes on that previous on that diagram. Yes, the diagram chart here. Chart, right, yeah. It says if the uh, SWR is one, the reflection coefficient is zero. Yes, nothing's coming back. So why is the loss infinite? Oh, um, remember, there's nothing coming back. So if I say one voltage, one volt out, and zero comes back, I've lost it all. So the return is like you know thousand dB. It's it's everything. Remember the return loss is the what's coming back compared to what went forward. Nothing's coming back, so I've lost it all. I give you thousand dollars. You go to the horse race. You bet your thousand bucks. You lose it all. That's a big return loss, right? There you go. Okay, so that says re return loss is a good thing. Yes. In other words, yes. Oh, yeah. So the betting isn't so good. Yeah, because in my antenna, I want it to accept all the energy and radiate it, not reflect it back. Yeah. Yes. I pr did I say that wrong? Yes. For an antenna, I want the return loss to be big. I want the reflection coefficient to be small, and I want the SWR to be 1. Got it? I, I didn't stand what this I, I just. Maybe I explained it. Number in the middle yes. sounds counterintuitive. I have yeah. to think about it. Oh, yeah, because this is what's coming back. I don't want anything coming back. So I want it to be a big loss compared to what's, what's as always compared to what went forward. I'll come back to that. That's why I think of it as negative. Um, so we calibrate this little $50 nano, well, Jeremy's $100 nano VNA using these standards that obviously someone else manufactured. The S is easy, a short, there's just a wire in here, shorts the pin and the shield. The open is easy, there's nothing in here, so the pin and the shield don't touch, but you're still supposed to screw this connector on. The load, this is what makes it critical. I could put a load in here of 50 ohms, and I can calibrate my nano VNA based on 50 ohms. Why do I want to do that? Because that's our sort of universal standard for uh, antennas and coax and radios. Now, you can do the calibration right here on the device itself. It's a little hard because I can't read the screen and you gotta poke these things. But the calibration standards you just screw on here. What does that mean? It means this is my calibration plane. When I first started to uh, look at this, uh, the, so what? I don't care where my calibration plane is. Ah, but as you get higher and higher frequency like into the gigahertz, you put on six inches of coax and that changes everything. So you can define where your calibration plane is. Most of us probably when we get this, just screw these adapters right into there. I'll show you what happens. So I screw in the uh, short, the S, and it plots on my Smith chart. Now I'm graphing this with nano VNA saver, but you can see it on the little device itself if you can see in that small screen. It plots right here, zero. Yeah, because I plugged in a direct short right into the port one, so it plots it there, zero. I plug in the open connector. Well, it would be the same if I didn't put it on there, really, at most frequencies. It plots the open here. So the open is infinite resistance, right? Uh, you know, thousands and thousands of ohms, no reactance. So it plots here. So the Smith chart has zero at the left end and infinite, you know, big on the right end. Now the key, I plug in my 50 ohm standard and it plots right here. Oh, after I plug in and say calibrate, you know, I have to say, yeah, you know. Now I calibrate it over some frequency range. I can do it on over three and a half to four megahertz. And I save the file and I say, here's my 80 meter calibration or my 20 meter or my 10 meter or my two meter. I can actually calibrate it, but it's not a good idea from one to 500 megahertz. First, I mean, think of that enormous frequency range. I'd need a lot of calibration points. And if I did it on the computer, taking a couple thousand data points, that might take 10 minutes to, to do. And I never want to look at, you know, one to 500 megahertz. So what, what would that show me? So I make a calibration for each of the ham bands. And I made one from one to 100 megahertz just to play with it. The important thing is the software knows to plot 50 right here. Does that make sense? That's the key to how this works. If I didn't do this, this is a piece of junk. And you can calibrate it right here on the screen. Now, it, it took me a while to learn how to do this. Yes, what? 
Yeah, one question. When you do the calibration, there's also the there's the option for the through where you connect the coax from one input to the other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, if you just use the uh, one port, like for an antenna, you're not worried about what goes through. But if you look at your calibration standards right here, um, you can go from this to this with a little cable like a jumper and then back in. So you can calibrate it from channel one to channel two or zero to one. That's the through calibration. Mm -hmm. That only needs um, you know, uh, the once pass through and the zero and the infinite ohms. Mm -hmm. I think built into channel one is uh, also a 50 ohm impedance. So you don't have to worry about that. Okay, this was interesting. Not so much the drawing here with all the cool math here, but all right, so why do I care where I calibrate it? Well, I learned you better care. So here's the interesting thing, and I played with this in the last week, and I thought this is just so cool. I should have shown you last time, but I didn't understand it. What if I just attach to port one 100 feet of coax? I just have 100 feet behind me here. Why 100 feet? Because I buy it in 100 foot rolls. All right, so I have 100 feet of coax, and then I put my short, my open, and my load here what is, uh, over some frequency range. Now what am I doing? I'm calibrating zero, infinite, and 50 ohms at the end of my 100 feet of coax. In other words, I'm telling the nano VNA, my calibration plane is at the far end of the coax. Ah, you see the advantage here? Now, if I have 100 feet of coax to my antenna and I use this nano VNA and look at different parameters, it's as if my nano VNA were connected right at the feed line. But it isn't, it's 100 feet away. So I've calibrated it at the end of 100 feet. Why 100 feet? Because most of my antennas are 100 feet of coax. Very cool, I tried it, it works beautifully. And uh, there's a certain advantage to it doing it this way. I can also, correct in the software. Now I thought, I didn't want to talk about this last time because I didn't really quite understand it. There's something called calibration assistant. I always like assistants. Okay. And when I do the calibration of the short, the load, and the open, I can play with this. Do you see where I'm pointing to here? It says 1.00 PS. <laughs> what the devil's a PS? A picosecond. <laughs> what? You know, pico. That's 10 to the minus 12, right? So this thing wants to know what's my calibration in picoseconds? Yes. <laughs> I thought, oh, this is like, you know, a 50 buck thing knows what a picosecond is. Or is it pico? Pico? I think it's pico. All right, so what does that mean? It means I can calibrate my device, Jeremy, at the end of the device. And then if, let's say, I have, uh, I'll just say, 100 feet of uh, good quality 50 ohm coax to my antenna but I've calibrated it right at the edge of the nano VNA, I can tell the software, okay, look, I've got 100 feet of coax. I want you to null it out in software. So now, this is not in feet, it's in picoseconds. But there's a formula, it's easy to remember. Coax, speed of light, or speed of a radio wave, one foot for nanosecond. Wait a minute, wait, nano pico, what was it? One foot per nanosecond, this is about a thousand, uh, that's about one foot for a thousand picoseconds, right? There's a thousand picoseconds in one nanosecond. Did I get that right? Nano is 10 to the minus nine. Pico is 10 to the minus 12, so yeah. So that's a thousand picoseconds. So if I have one foot of coax, I put in here 1,000. Okay, one th so I wish it were calibrated in nanoseconds, but it won't do that. So let's say I calibrate it with 100 feet of coax. What do I do? I put in this number here, 100,000. I was like, that's a big number. Yeah, but it's picoseconds. So if I type in 100,000 picoseconds and press calibrate, what it does is it moves everything by a phase, a delay of uh, 100 feet of coax. And I thought, oh, that's so cool. I just tried it like 20 minutes ago and it worked, but I didn't get the slide set up to show you. So in other words, you can be even really clever with this and judging by how much coax, coax you have to different antennas, you can essentially null out the coax. Why do I want to do that? Oh, because the impedance I measure in my shack isn't the same as the impedance out of the antenna. All right, I probably lost one or two of you on that one, or I think I lost myself, but 
that's an important thing that the gadget for 50 bucks can null out whatever coax feed line I have either by physically setting it up in my shack and doing the standards or by software I thought oh, that, that's that's too cool for 50 bucks let's come back to antennas now all right so on antennas we're always concerned about you know how well do they work I don't want to put up an expensive antenna climb a tree put up a tower and then it doesn't work that's no good so let's go back to something real 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 basic your grandkids on a swing and you know this happens to me every time we go to the park she jumps right on the swing and says okay grampy do your thing so my job's of course push all right how do i know when to push well everybody knows when to push you got to push what when she's coming back so picture this as an n-fed dipole well it is an n-fed dipole that's what i see what what she's going back and forth what's that that's the current on your antenna she's representing the current but it's an n-fed right because i'm pushing at the end of her swing so it's an n-fed dipole all right what what's that what am i i'm the feed line i'm telling the current antenna current when to push right now you see it it wasn't until i saw this analogy i thought this explains phase if grampy pushes just at the right time what does that mean well the kid knows that Grampy push in phase with my natural swinging. That will increase my amplitude. She knows that. She doesn't use those words. Grampy, 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 push at the right time. Pay attention, Grampy. So if I push too soon, I crash into her. That's no good. If I push too late, that's worse. I'm running after her to try to push. So Grampy's got to push in phase with her natural swing. Now, what determines her natural swing? Well, for her, it's easy. It's, you know, the length of the pendulum. What about for an NFED antenna? Well, it depends on your frequency. So if it's a typical, you know, uh, NFED half wave antenna, that makes the math really simple. As the current goes back and forth from one end to the next end, one end, you're feeding it at one end. Well, that's no problem. You just got to feed it in phase with the way the current normally wants to move at that particular frequency on that particular length of antenna. That's given a word. What's the word? What's the magic word when you push in phase with the natural vibrations of the electrons on your antenna? Unmute. What's the natural word we're looking for? Resonance. Resonance. Okay, so the input push from the feed line, well, I say it needs to be, maybe should be, in phase with the natural vibrations of the current on the antenna conductors. That's resonance. When I see it that way, I think, oh, that's easy. But that does not imply that I can't operate a little bit off resonance. But this is like the ideal. So can this little $50 nano VNA tell Grampy when to push? Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, so cool. Can my SWR meter tell me when Grampy should push? No, <laughs> SWR is very limited information. All right, so resonance, we're looking for resonance. So Grampy pushes too soon. Uh, the SWR goes up. Grampy pushes too late. Equally, the SWR goes up. Grampy's got to push at the right time. The phase angle at resonance is a magic number. What's the phase angle at resonance? Zero. Zero degrees. We're not leading. We're not lagging. Okay, so I get reactance now. Reactance is just Grampy's not pushing at the right time. Keep that in mind. I mean, it's a rough analogy, but I think it works. So why is resonance so important? Oh, what well, resonance, you get the maximum current on your antenna. So what? Oh, the maximum antenna current's the maximum radiation. Oh, well, that I care about. You know, I want my antenna to work well. You know, I bought this expensive radio. I want my antenna to work well. So it should work best, sort of, at the point where the natural vibrations of the electrons on the wire are being fed from the feed line in phase, in phase, in phase, in phase. So, well, we know we can operate QSY and it doesn't collapse. So what happens? If I operate below resonance, the current gets out of phase. It leads the voltage. You know, the kid's swinging back and forth faster than Grampy's pushing. If I operate at a higher frequency than the resonant, you know, I'm looking at this as a half-wave dipole. Well, that's just as bad. The current lags the voltage. Current lags the voltage. One's called capacitive, one's called inductive. Who cares about the words? The important thing is, Grampy, pay attention, push at the right time. So for exams, we had to memorize Eli the Iceman. I don't want to go over that. That's kind of boring stuff. But uh, 
Phase problems cause higher SWR. Your antenna doesn't work as well. Grampy's not paying attention. So basically, an antenna looks like this. It looks like an antenna has a resistance and a reactance. The reactance can be either looking like an inductor or looking like a capacitor. So we can sort of model an antenna as this kind of a circuit fed with some source like my transmitter. And then there's some feed line that comes up to here. So it behaves like a series circuit. Okay. Resonance will make your grandkids happy. Okay. We want to cancel reactance. But what happens if we QSY? We, we often want to work a whole 80 meter band. We can't magically make my antenna resonate at every frequency I'm operating on, or can we? So, I want to know, well, I've got SWR meters. Aren't they just as good as this little nano VNA? No. <laughs> if I put an SWR meter right at my antenna feed line, and let's say it reads 2 to 1 on some frequency on 80 meters. I'm just picking 80 meters. My SWR meter up here says 2 to 1. And down here in my shack, I have the identical meter. I hook it up, and what does it read? Two to one, thinking, oh, well, I know it's not ideal, but I don't know how to fix it. The SWR meter is just giving me very limited information about what's happening forward and backward. It's useful, but I can learn much, much more from this nano VNA. It measures much more than just SWR. Okay, so what if I have a perfect antenna? Perfect antenna, what does that mean? I send a signal to it at 3.8 megahertz, and here's how it plots. On a Smith chart, I get my resistance right here and no reactance. The reflection coefficient, zero. Nothing comes back. It's perfect. My I hope it radiates. Maybe it's a light bulb. I don't know. But hey, you can't get any better than this. The SWR is one to one. Nothing reflected. But that's only one point on this whole Smith chart. But that's my bullseye. All right, so I ping on some frequencies. And I get something like this, and I'm thinking, oh, I'm pretty far from the bullseye. Well, I'm not that far. The reflection coefficient's 0.2. What does that mean? 20% of the voltage comes back. Eh, I don't like that. But the SWR, if you convert it, is only 1.5 to 1. My radio works fine. What does that mean? If my antenna landed anywhere on this circle, anywhere on the rim, it would have a different impedance, but the same SWR. Whoa! Um, I talked at a ham club about two months ago, and I said, if I have, let's say, an 80-meter dipole, and my SWR meter reads 2 to 1, and I move my SWR meter up and down the coax, what do I discover? Basically, the SWR still stays the same. I mean, give or take a little bit. But the impedance has gone all over the place. Why? Why does the impedance change on my 100 feet of coax the resistance, reactance, the phase, they're all changing, but the SWR does not change. Someone unmute, tell me why that happens. And total silence. I mean, you know, as hams, we have to kind of learn about this stuff, but we often don't have to explain why it works. We just have to get the right answer, A, B, C, D, E. So I want to try to come back to this and see if I can give a little more background as to why the SWR doesn't change on my feed line. I mean, uh, if I add 10, 20 feet, not 1,000 feet. All right, so this is looking not so good, but hey, my radio is happy. SWR one and a half. I'm working the world. Now, the next frequency, oh, now my SWR is two to one. Oh, well, my radio still works. I'm happy, two to one. That means my antenna can be anywhere, anywhere on the rim of this circle, on the Smith chart, at some frequency, anywhere, and the SWR is 2 to 1, although every point on here represents a different resistance reactance. Every point on here is a different impedance, but the same SWR. All right, so far, it's getting worse. Now I've got an SWR 3 to 1. My rig starts to fold back. Sometimes radios don't even work. What's happening? Well, obviously, something's not so good here. There's not a good match between my feed line and the antenna. It's sending back a lot of the energy. 25% of the radio's power is coming back. Now, I don't know what happens to it, but it's not radiating. It's coming back towards my radio. I don't like that. It's like, duck, here comes 25 watts. So again, my goal is to be in the center, and my antenna is somewhere on this rim of the circle. That's not so good. I'm getting unhappy. My rig's unhappy. 
My granddaughter's really unhappy. I'm not pushing at the right time. SWR four to one. Now I'm getting 60% reflected. It's getting worse and worse. Wait a minute. Now 90% of the voltage is coming back. Hey, my SWR meter reads 20 to one. I'm not working anybody, even my neighbor. <laughs> Nothing's working. No good. So what's the worst that could be? Well, I could get a reflection coefficient of one. That plots here. <laughs> 100% of the energy is reflected. The antenna is not accepting any power at all. Well, it's like throwing a tennis ball against a brick wall. Everything comes back. Definitely not good. So, the gadget's clever enough to show me what's happening. Now can I fix it? That's the thing. So, quick, quick couple of questions here. So, here's a Smith chart of a fictitious antenna. And I ping it at different frequencies, A, B, C, D, E. Okay, so this is an antenna operating on some band. My question to you guys is, where is this antenna resonant? So think about it for a moment, unmute. There's only five of you left here. So call out an answer. Where is the antenna resonant, if anywhere? Unmute, call out your answers. Looks like both B and D, because the reactance goes to zero. Okay, here, Jeremy, for a B and D. Others? I'll take a C. C. Okay, and why? why I, I didn't know who said that. Uh, who said C, and can you explain? In... I said C because it's more towards the uh, center point there. Yeah, that's correct. Right. C is hey, can, closer can I to the center. Can I register that I said C also? Yes, who was that? That's Dennis. Oh, Dennis, C. Okay, so resonant. I'll now, wait a, a minute. I'm saying resonant. Now, let me show you my next question, Dennis. Where's the lowest SWR? Are these the same question? No. no. <laughs> Be careful, careful. What does resonant mean? Resonant means strictly, strictly. No reactance. So what points oh, represent well, you a have total... Resonance, you have resonance in quotes. So I, I oh, took, yeah. Well, I took maybe. it to be little. Oh, okay, okay. Right? All right, that's good criticism. All right, where's the antenna resonant? <laughs> At B and D. Jeremy's right. Why is Jeremy right? Oh, I know Jeremy's always right, but besides that, B and D show no reactants. Yes, but they have the wrong. Uh, they have the wrong real part. Y yes, 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 yes. So my next question: so Where is the? Have, but therefore they'll have reflected power. That wasn't my question. Oh, okay. Yeah, you're right. They will. So the next question: You're right. I'm sorry. I should, shouldn't say it that way. You're right, but that wasn't the question. Where's the SWR lowest? Let's look at this one now. Probably around C. C is the lowest SWR. I want to be in the bullseye. Bullseye, bullseye, bullseye. So the lowest SWR is C, but C has some resistance and reactance, right? It has an impedance, and it's not 50 ohms. But it's closest to 50 ohms than A, B, D, or E. So this is where it gets a little kind of subtle. It's like a little dance here. Resonance does not mean lowest SWR. Now, I did this on a fake antenna, but I'll show you on a real antenna. It may, but it doesn't have to be. Um, I thought, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. It defied my, you know, and I'm a physics professor. I said, no, 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 wait a minute. I got confused. Resonance is a very distinct definition, the way it's used uh, in electronics here. Resonance means the L and the C, if there is one, they're canceling. It's only at a resistance. Now, the SWR has to do with how well you're matching your antenna to your feed line. That's a different issue. So at C, I have, I'm closest to the bullseye. C is closest to the bullseye. C is closest to the 50 ohm match. C is the lowest SWR. What's happening at E? Z is awful. Z is a high resistance and a high reactance. So E would be really hard to match the coax. A is also hard to match the coax. It's like A is my hamstick. A is like five ohms. <laughs> That's no good. And I actually have a hamstick and I've measured it at five or eight ohms. A, it's hard to match a hamstick to 50 ohm coax without a matching gadget of some kind. Now, so I made up this slide and I thought, oh, do I go here? But uh, I'm retired. I have nothing to lose. Now, where's the lowest SWR? Unmute and call it out. All right, unmute, call it out, folks. Come on. Where is the lowest SWR? A, B, C, D. Looks like they're probably the same in all of them, but A and D might be easier to match. 
That wasn't my question, though. Okay, yeah, right on both cases, yeah. So SWR is strictly how far are you from the bullseye, if that's 50 ohms, and I said here 50 ohms. They're all equally poor. They're all maybe two to one match here. They're not awful, but they're not real close to the bullseye. So the lowest SWR, they're all the same. Now, I could ask a different question, but I didn't want to you know, uh, dwell on this. Uh, which ones have the lowest uh, resistance? That would be A and D. Which ones have the highest resistance? That would be B and C. They're farther to the right. But they're all the same SWR. So SWR can be the same number, like my SWR meter says 2 to 1. But I can have any, any impedance value and get that same SWR value. I didn't know that. when I, Even when I passed the extra license, I didn't know that. Or maybe I knew the right answer to the question about that, but I couldn't explain why. So, you know, there's knowing and there's understanding. So we're looking at a little deeper level here. S lowest SWR and, low and uh, resonance is not the same thing. Okay, so let's come back to our real antenna. So what would the impedance look like if I'm operating off resonance? That's where I wanted to start tonight, but I thought I just can't do that. So here, I'm picking on 80 meters because I love that band. It's, you know, wide band. So when I operate off resonant free, let's say my antenna is res. My antenna raising that said, let's say 3.8 megahertz. Okay. So I operate at 3.5. Ah. What happens? My antenna is not a good match to my feed line, but maybe I can still work. So what happens to the resistance and the reactance? The interesting thing is the resistance part doesn't change by much. The resistance of a dipole up in a tree, maybe 40, 50, 60, 70 ohms, something like that. The reactance, that depends on Grampy. What's the phase doing? Okay, so if I look at a sample antenna, I pulled this off of the Walt Maxwell book and when I photographed it, it blurred a little bit. So here's reactance plotted vertically and resistance horizontally. This is not a Smith chart, obviously, but it's a little easier to interpret. So right here, where the reactance is zero, it says about 3.65 megahertz. Okay, now, it's about 40 ohms resistance. So the SWR there is not one to one. If it's 50 ohm coax, maybe the SWR is one and a half to one or something. Okay, but what happens when I QSY down the band? Well, down the band's this way. See, the resistance doesn't change by much. It's still somewhere between uh, 35 and 50 ohms. But what's the reactance doing? Oh, the reactance going negative 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. So at the bottom of the band, I have 60 ohms of reactance. That's awful. That's hard to match the coax. Grampy's getting smashed by the grandkid. Grampy, get, wake up, Grampy. It's equally bad up here, 3.8 megahertz. Now there's 60 ohms of inductive reactance. That's awful. But this is real. Antennas do this. So how do I make an antenna on 80 meters that works everywhere? Well, that's, people have been writing QSD articles about that for you know, 50 years. Here's what it looks like on the Smith chart, and this is from my Nano VNA. This is my 80 meter antenna. So position one, I'm far from the bullseye, and I'm up here to the right, which means higher resistance, and down here, meaning it's a capacitive reactance. Or is it? Oh, wait, wait. I'm measuring this in my shack. My antenna is 150 feet away, so no. In my shack, at the end of my coax, this is what I see. I see high, in other words, one is not a good match to my coax, but I'm measuring it in my shack. Two looks like, oh, that's a nice match to my coax. It's near the bullseye. So my coax and my rig are happy at 3.6 megahertz. Ah, perfect. Position three, now look at this. This is my antenna. Position three, 3.7 megahertz. Is position three also a resonant frequency at the end of my coax? Yes. <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute. I know my antenna itself does not resonate at 3.7 megahertz. I know that. It resonates at about 3.6 megahertz. Okay, so what's happening here? Well, my feed line is playing games with the R and the X values. How can it do that? Well, that's a good question. How does the coax screw up my impedance? Mixes it up. What happens, but three is resonant. Three, position three, marker three, 3.7 megahertz. That's a resonant frequency, but it's not a low SWR. The SWR here might be three, four to one. 
position four, five, and six are getting worse because I'm going, what, higher up the band. So my antenna basically is too long. I like to operate in the CW part of the band, so my antenna works best where I like to operate. So what can I do to fix this? Oh, I can cut off some 10 feet from my wire. Well, I don't want to do that, then I can't operate at the bottom of the band. So here's the basic problem that all hams operating on 80 meters face. How do I get one antenna to work well on the whole band? Well, um, there are clever tricks you can do. You can put up two or three different parallel antennas, more wire. Tune one wire to the bottom of the band, tune one wire to the top of the band. When I lived at West Town, I did that. And one, one of my sets of two wires was tuned up for 3550. And the other was set up tuned much shorter by about 15 feet, was set up for 3990. So I could work really well at the bottom of the band and the top of the band with low SWR, same coax. Guess what? I couldn't work in the middle of the band. The SWR is 5 to 1. But I didn't care about that. So this is so cool, so cool. My nano VNA is telling me in my shack what I should do up at the antenna to make it work better or at some other frequency. So here's what we basically do if we, if we compensate. We put something down here in our shack called an antenna tuner. How does it work? Well, that's the next 10 minutes. How does it, how does it work? It's sort of magic. And uh, it's kind of interesting to get into the weeds as to how this thing works. But basically, it's trying to say, Grampy, 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 you're not doing the right thing. Sort of. So what's the goal of this? The goal is this, make your radio happy. <laughs> All right. I want the radio to see a one-to-one -one SWR. Reflection here of zero. So my SWR meter here says one-to-one, -one, perfect. My radio puts out 100 watts. It doesn't care what's going down the line. It's putting out 100 watts. My antenna tuner, I have to tune this carefully. So what happens? When that 100 watts gets up to the antenna, and I'm not operating at the resonant frequency, I'm just going to make up a number. 25 watts gets reflected. What does that mean? It means that's real power. 25 watts is coming back towards my radio, back into the shack. It comes back here, and if I had an SWR meter out here, it might read 3 to 1. All right, so what does that mean? It means that 25 watts is coming. Now, if I didn't have the tuner, what would happen? Well, that's another hour talk. That 25 watts can come back in here and change the impedance and the output, and the radio is no longer happy. And the radio says, whoa, whoa, whoa. To protect our finals, we're going to cut back on the power. And that's what most of the modern rigs do. If you get an SWR 2, 3, 4 to 1, the rig automatically throttles back the power or even turns off and flashes, you know, something. Warning, warning, warning. And that's happened to me a couple times when, guess what? I had the wrong antenna switch, you know. I'm on 80 meters with my 10-meter antenna. It's like, yikes, what did I do? Barry, but I'm going to be that the kid in the back of the room that uh, was sleeping but finally woke up. Yeah, yeah. As, as a question. Yeah. Uh, I'm looking at this. This. Um, the this number's device. not right. Yeah, yeah I was yeah. going to just say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, really. I, I would like the, to patent the, this. The, yeah. I would uh, like to uh, patent this because this is, uh, <laughs> I was hoping no one would see that. The number's right for a first pass, though. 25 watts comes back. Now, if my antenna you, tuner is created, working you, correctly, yeah, I know. You power. caught my error. Okay. You caught my error. 25 go, watts is back coming back. And what does the antenna tuner do? I'm not going to tell you how right now, but it turns that 25 watts around and says, back to the antenna, dude. So what happens? Now there's 125 watts going to the antenna. Is that correct? Yes. I put power meters here and here. This power meter reads higher than this one by 25, well, by about 30 watts. What? I'm getting free energy. No, not really. The energy that got reflected here and coming back, what does the tuner do? The tuner re-reflects that power. That's like, oh, come on. Yeah, re-reflects it? What is it? That sounds like voodoo. It does, but it's not voodoo. It's real science. How does it do that? It does it by producing what's called a conjugate match. Now, that's just a fancy word. But what it does is it introduces in the tuner the opposite reactance that's up here. So the lousy reactance here is canceled by another lousy, well, it's not so lousy, reactance here to turn the wave right around. So now I have 125 watts approaching the antenna. So if it does this multiple times with an SWR 3 to 1, you end up with the correct number being about 135 watts. Uh, did I get it right now, Dennis? <laughs> if the numbers are close. All right, I'm not going to worry about it. So here's my problem. I set up an antenna, and I just say, all right, at some frequency, what's, what's the resistance or reactance? And my antenna lands here. 
This is just a pretend antenna. My antenna is 10 plus J25. Now, I'm measuring this in my shack, granted. Okay, 10 plus 25. That's no good. <laughs> my radio is not going to work into that. So I want to correct that. What do I do? I put in an antenna tuner. What's the job of the tuner here on a Smith chart? I know the tuner's job is to literally make the radio happy, but how does it do that? It's got to move this point from here to the center. Well, what do you mean move it? It's not like a, a Derek pick it up and move it. How, how does an antenna tuner move my data from 10 plus J25 to 50 plus J0, my ideal match? How does it do that? Do we have time to look into that? That's really digging into the weeds. So how does an antenna tuner work? All right, so just a couple slides and then we're going to take a break here. On a Smith chart, resistance and reactant. Resistance is horizontal. Reactance goes up and down. So if I have a series inductor in my tuner, it moves the points on a Smith chart clockwise. A series inductor. Series, and series with the center pin and the wire, not the shielding. So what happens? My impedance mo my reactance moves clockwise as I add more and more inductance. What if I take the inductor and put it across the coax between the center and the shield in parallel? Then the inductor moves this way. In other words, how I hooked up my inductor in my antenna tuner, how I have it arranged, will move the resistance reactance in two different circle directions. How about a capacitor? Oh, they work out the other way. A parallel capacitor will move this way and a series capacitor will move this way. So if I want to increase the impedance, if I want to increase, I basically am looking at the series component. And I can do it maybe with a, a capacitor, maybe with an inductor. If I want to decrease the impedance to match 50 ohms, then I want to think about the parallel part of the circuit first. This is just a real general guideline. Let's look at how that works. I'm going to skip that one. So let's say I have a, uh, an antenna. Let's go over here. My antenna is somewhere here in the white region. Forbidden means this won't work here. So my antenna pings somewhere out here. I could hook up a single coil and a single capacitor in this configuration. And if I have the right values, I can move an impedance anywhere here to the center. Whoa, that is magic. <laughs> it's like, wow, that's pretty cool. What if I have a low impedance here? This is low value here. A low anywhere in here, not in the forbidden region. Then all I do is interchange what? The coil now becomes in series and the capacitor is in parallel. I can move any point here, meaning the antenna, any point to the center, 50 ohms, with this circuit with specific values. That's called an L network because it kind of looks like the letter L. Here's the other combination. What if I'm up here? Oh, easy. All I still need is a coil and capacitor, but I now hook it up so if I'm a high impedance up here, the capacitor is on the high impedance side, the inductors and the series side. This combination and only the correct two numbers, there's only a unique value of L and C that'll do it. What if I'm at a low uh, inductive reactance up here? Okay, it still works. Now I have the capacitor in series, right? and the inductor in parallel. I can, with this circuit, I can move any impedance here to the center. Now what if I make them adjustable inductors and capacitors? That's what I would do, right? All right, so here's the way L networks work, basically, without looking at the gory impedance, uh, you know, complex number business. If I make a variable, variable capacitor and a variable inductor and hook the inductor to ground, the inductor to ground, Depending on which side the capacitor is on, I can match high or low impedances. If I put the capacitor to ground and the inductors in the series element, I can do the same thing, almost. I can move the impedance from something awful to 50 ohms. With one, one of these four circuits will work fine, one of them. And another one might work, eh, sort of, but there would be an ideal combination for physical size. I mean, you know, something that fits in a box. That is so cool. How do these work? They're moving just a reactance from one bad value to another bad value, and the two bad values cancel each other. Grampy's pushing in phase again. Well, that's what we want. So here's the way most 
tuners set up. To be a little more versatile, they put a capacitor and an inductor, like an L network, and another capacitor. Wait a minute, now you got two capacitors, yes. Because this can match the high and the low just by twiddling these two things. Now, if you make the inductor a variable inductor with on this MFJ, has coil taps and a switch, then you could tune basically anything from 10 ohms to 500 ohms with one gadget. This thing will. And this is like a 50 buck, you know, fifty dollar tuner. It's made out of, it's MFJ, mighty fine junk. But this is the circuit. It works. My old transmitter didn't have that. It had this configuration. It had a vacuum tube. Oh, I love tubes. The impedance of the tube is a couple thousand ohms. I want to match that to 50 ohm coax. That's no good. So this Pi network moves the impedance on the Smith chart from, let's say, 1,000 ohms here to 50 ohms here. How does it do that? Well, it does it by introducing what's called a tuning capacitor and a loading capacitor and an inductor. And when you fiddle with these three components, you can match 50 ohms. But you got to tune it just right. So when I was a kid, I had a DX100, and that was really hard to do. And if you mess up, you can burn up your radio. So here's what it looks like. This isn't my radio, but it had a tuning capacitor, a coil, and a loading capacitor, and, you know, some sort of a tube amplifier. So one more example, and then we'll stop, because I see it's after 8.30. So uh, I wanted to show you, uh, this is my antenna. It's a 10-meter vertical antenna. I'm feeding it with 100 feet of good quality new 50-ohm coax. I, at the end of the coax, I take my nano VNA and I do a Smith chart. 10 meters, easy to measure. 28.0 is marker one, that's here. 28.2, 28.3 is closest to the bullseye. All right, I wanna operate uh, at the low end of the phone band, so it's really good there. 28.6, eight and nine, so marker six is way up here, but hey look, the SWR is just two to one. At the same time I got this graph, I got this graph. Now this is with my nano VNA and the VNA saver. So what's the software telling me? Here's SWR. Here's two, here's one. So it's one and a half at the bottom of the band. That's fine. It's about 1.07 at the resonant bottom of the band. Oh, it's perfect. It's like great. At uh, the low end of the phone band where I want to really work, uh, the SWR is fantastic. But it's only two to one up at 29 mega. So my radio is operating anywhere here. So I wanted to think, well, let me see here. What can I do if I do this? I'm going to add six four more feet of coax. Now, I already have 100 feet, but I'm just going to add six more feet of coax. That's between the antenna and my radio, or in this case, between the antenna and the VNA. So I want you to unmute, look at these two graphs, and tell me what's going to happen, if anything, maybe nothing happens. I'm going to add six feet of coax. What happens to the Smith chart reading? What happens to the SWR reading? Now, this is a quiz at the end of my talk, and I realize it's 8.36. I've gone over time. I hope uh, everyone's not napping too much. Unmute. Well, th think. I need a prize to whoever gets this right. Think. Which of these graphs is going to change, and if so, how? By just adding six feet of coax, not tuning up anything else. Not touching a thing. Just adding six more feet of 50 ohm coax. So think for a minute, unmute, and give an answer. Well, the phase at the load is changing, so therefore kiss the Smith chart to be different, and the Viswar is not going to change. All right. If, thank you, Dennis. If, if your connectors are really good. Yeah. Oh, barrel, my connectors are really good. your connector is very good. Yeah, my excellent, you know, Amphenol connector. Yeah. Good answer, Dennis. If Others? People, no, it's, it's what you said, Barry. It's all in the face. Yeah. Others? Or does yeah. anyone think differently from Dennis? <laughs> Ideally, it shouldn't change much. But yeah, I think that the curve... What's the it? It won't change. What's the it? The SWR okay. shouldn't change. Uh, now I, I've had some weird cases where it does, where if you change the length... Oh, of we should talk about that. Well, let's, let's, let's yeah. finish this up, and then we'll take that as the first question. That's a great first question. Ideally, the SWR wouldn't change, but the, uh, the little spiral on the uh, Smith chart might rotate a bit. Now, six feet, let me think quickly. Six feet, while well, I'm on 10 meters. I remember 10 meters, the, the CB whips are about eight and a half feet, right? So a quarter wave is about eight and a half feet. But this is coax. Well, so what? Well, it's good co coax. 
Well, the velocity factor isn't 100%. So let's say the velocity factor in RG213 is about 70%, something like that, 0.7. So the speed of the RF in the coax is only 70% the speed of light in a vacuum. All right, so 70% of 8.5. Well, let's just call it 8. So 8 times 0 0.7, 5.6. So, so basically, 6 feet is what? About a quarter wavelength. So I could have rephrased the, set, the question and said, I'm going to add a quarter wavelength of coax with good barrel connectors. So what is that going to do to my Smith chart, Jeremy? A quarter wave. That could be like a 90 degree rotation. All right, let's see. Look at that. 180 degrees. Yeah. Nine, yeah, see, that's an important one. A 90 degree moves the Smith chart 180 I'm, degrees. I'm, Whoa! I'm when I first looked at this, I thought, oh, no, I don't want to go 90 degrees, right? Nine, it's a quarter wavelength. No. If I have a half wavelength, what would happen? It goes around completely and lends just at this. In other words, every half wavelength, the impedance comes back to the same values. Jeremy, I'm um, going to send you a, um, uh, some PowerPoints on the telegrapher's equations where you see the factor <laughs> of two <laughs> clearly <laughs> indicated in but look, this was a $50 gadget. Come on. Look at this. The SWR and then SWR. If I can impose these, see? The SWR is the same. Well, um, now if I added 1,000 feet, it wouldn't be because I'm losing energy in 1,000 feet. But essentially, the SWR does not change on your coax when you move up and down the coax. Unless, unless. So think about this for a second, Jeremy. If you've got more coax, maybe the braid, the shield, isn't really doing what it's supposed to do. So try this. Here's a good trick, especially if you're on 10 meters or 2 meters or 440. Try this. As you're looking at the SWR meter, right? Jeremy, are you watching? Mm -hmm. Grab the coax in your hand and move your co move your hand up and down the coax, and you'll put see a, the SWR of, meter go up and down. Put a piece of aluminum foil around it. Oh, sense. that's even better, yeah. <laughs> so, so what does that mean? Oh, it means what? Oh, the shield is really part of the antenna. I'm not well grounded. So that's that's another level of sophistication here. I, I, but thought, everybody, I, I thought everybody runs a ballon on a dipole. Come on. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, that gets us more into the weeds. I think that's where I ended. Oh, so here's, all right, I'll stop with this one. So Jeremy, here we go. So if your load, your antenna, begins here with L equals zero. Well, you know, like uh, you're right at your antenna here. If you add, add one eighth of a wavelength of feed line, it moves this far, 90 degrees. If you add uh, 90 degrees of feed line, you're up. Yeah. So it's moving twice as fast as my, so three eighths. So it should be a marker here. So if I add a half a wavelength, I'm back where I started. But the SWR doesn't change. It's like, well, oh, wait a minute, wait. Why doesn't the SWR change? Well, that's the really good question. Why doesn't it change? What determines the SWR? Grampy, what's ha where's Grampy? Grampy's up at the feed line. So if the mismatch is up at the feed line, fiddling around down here in my shack is not gonna change the mismatch that happens up here. The SWR on my feed line is still two to one, three to one, five to one. If that's so, how can my antenna tuner tune my antenna. Guess what? It doesn't. But Walt Maxwell made a good point. It tunes your antenna system, the whole thing. So that's like really, really deep into the woods. Antenna tuner is really a kind of a transmatch gadget. It's something that changes the impedance to something the radio is happy with, 50 ohms. So is there a way I can fix this at the antenna? Yes, <laughs> of course. What could I do? I could put my tuner up at the antenna, but that's a couple hundred dollars worth of parts and waterproof it and all that. And guess what? On 80 meters, I don't care. With an SWR of, let's say, 5 to 1, that's pretty lousy, on my 100 feet of RG213, how much extra power do I lose because I have a high SWR? How much power do I lose? 10 watts. Do I care about 10 watts with a 100 watt radio? No. So it'll actually work fine. Whoops. I need to find the one slide I'm looking for back here somewhere. 
Where's my one slide? Here it is. So as long as my tuner doesn't burn up, right? I mean, you got to be careful with a kilowatt. As long as the tuner is letting your radio see 50 ohms, the additional loss in this coax, maybe it's 100 feet, because it has a lousy SWR on 80 meters, it isn't worth worrying about. There's no reason to broadband an 80 meter dipole. There's no reason to get all these complicated QST articles with bazooka antennas and all this crap just to get a low SWR in 80 meters. Don't worry about it. Or take the coax out and put in ladder line and get a center balanced, you know, tuner. Now what Dennis mentioned is true and I didn't want to go there, but what happens here? We have a balanced antenna fed with unbalanced, unbalanced coax. So some of the RF on the shield can go to the antenna and come right back down on the shield. And Jeremy, that's what's happening. Now, if it happens at 440 or 2 meters, that's bad. Yeah. That's what you so, recommend if you're yeah. you put a couple of loops in your coax. Yes, yes. So the loop is acting as a choke. <laughs> what's, the, what's the antenna? It's a J-pole. Oh, they're notorious for that. Yes, yeah. J-pole antennas are great. I have one. I, well, I told you, I bought one at Kimberton. Uh, but at the end of the J-pole, you're feeding essentially, uh, well, an off-center fed. Think of a J-pole as, uh, uh, as a dipole and then feed it at the three-quarter point. So you got one-quarter, three-quarter, and then flip it up so they're now like this. So the, the smaller, the quarter wavelength is now looking more like a transmission line. So you have a quarter wave transmission line than a half wave end fed. So that would be bad to feed that with coax without some sort of a choke right at the antenna. So a simple choke is just take 10 feet and wind it into a coil and tape it. Or you can get balance designed for those frequencies. Or the W2DU ballon, he claimed that was the best, is you just put the little ferrite rings on the shield of your coax. That prevents the coax from having energy going both ways. I need to stop here and hit stop share. I went way over. I always go way over. But I love this topic because I learned so much kind of researching it. Yeah, thanks, Barry. That was a great presentation. You're here. It certainly was. Thank Barry, you. Barry, here's my uh, Walt Map Maxwell's hard cover. Yes, yeah. It's so old, it's got a five and a quarter inch floppy. So oh, wow. That's I don't great. think I can read this anymore. <laughs> Um, the the fellow um, who is a good buddy of mine now, Cullen W five K five. I just forgot his call, H A L. Anyway, Cullen. Uh, he lived in New York and he knew Walt Maxwell well. They were at the same club, and uh, so he shared some personal stories about Walt Maxwell back in the nineteen fifties and sixties. And this was a guy who also was designing satellite antennas. Uh, and because of the short feed line and so forth, his comment was, you know, antennas don't have to be resonant to work well if you feed them properly. And even AM broadcast antennas, you know, they're, they're rarely, uh, you know, quarter wave resonant vertical, you know. Can everybody see this? Oh, very yes. nice. This is, uh, the course, I... Taught, I can tell you it's actually changed. This is the 2008 PowerPoint, 2008. So at that time, the textbook was called Transmission Lines First, even though it's the first course in electromagnetics. The concept was that they just got done circuit theory, so we should be able to go from lump circuit elements to the distributed circuit elements. So here's a section on Smith charts that we suffered these students in 2008 to go through. So it's Philip Smith. It's 1939. You were right about I've that. I've got to add that picture to my show. Oh, that's at, nice. At Bell yeah. I could, I'll send you this PowerPoint. Yeah. Um, uh, blah, blah, blah. The, the interesting comment is this one here. that um, He submitted this article to the IRE, and it was rejected. <laughs> so he ended up publishing it through the ISA. So which, it was rejected probably because they didn't understand it or see its oh, significance? Yeah, who, knows, who, knows, who knows, right? Whatever. But, uh, you know, Einstein, a, Einstein never won the Nobel Prize for relativity because when he published that, no one believed it. So this is what we did. The kids. Yeah. Oh, that. Look at that. Yeah. Look, a ratio of impedances. Yeah. Ratio and the reflection coefficients and how exponentials. And yeah. And of course, they did not use anything graphical because we had uh, MATLAB uh, um, apps oh, that yeah. actually did yeah. it for them and that kind of stuff. But uh, uh, unlike uh, going through uh, uh, transmatch and stuff like that, everything was done on uh, conjugate matches. But basically, I'll you know you go through all this stuff here and 
Here's the matching how, there. How you move from one impedance to another on a Smith oh, chart, is here, that here, obvious here. to engineer types? I No, in fact, it isn't. And in fact, what we had to do basically was to leave, use this as a, as a demonstration in, in fact, but in reality, we actually worked the equations. Here's the telegrapher's equation. Yeah, yeah. And we actually determine how you would do a quarter uh, wavelength um, a matching section with a different impedance, et cetera, and stuff like that. And then verify that on what the, what a Smith chart would do. I would say that most students got very confused very quickly. <laughs> I can say I why, use. yeah. But this is what we had them suffer through, you know, all kinds of stuff like this, which was the, this was actually chapter two already. Chapter one doesn't count. This is actually chapter two. Yeah. So they, were, they were getting this basically even before we got and the textbook is called, you can find it, called Early Transmission Line Approach. And it's uh, Stu Wentworth from Auburn, who I know very well. And we wrote a paper together. So we wow. show the uh, Smith chart. You know, it's too complicated to use. We don't want to do that. And um, I was going to show um, um, uh, Jeremy the, um, the um, uh, telegrapher's equation somewhere here. Power television. I can, I'm going to do it. can't find it. But, oh, yeah. Uh, well, we'll, we'll, let, we'll let that part go. Especially if it's a... Differential equation. <laughs> well, we try to simplify. Here, here's the factor. Yeah. Two. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's where you, That's where that factor two comes in about the when you have a quarter wave, it looks, you know, basically 180 degree rotation as a result. It comes directly. Yeah. So out. when you ask folks, so why why does the um, impedance come back to its original value every half a wavelength? That's a good question. Other than a little extra attenuation, but I mean. The impedance repeats every half a wavelength. Why? Well, because of the telegrapher's equations. <laughs> See, I think in terms of Grampy, why? Why? Grampy could push every other push and it would still work, wouldn't it? You know, the, the, the back story on, we also have, you could see in the beginning here, we talk about uh, transmission lines and here's the exact formula for coaxial. Oh, yeah, yeah, and yeah. That kind of stuff. And, Capacitance and so you change the dielectric, you change the velocity. Yeah. Well, here's here's some people that you probably I don't know. It depends upon how much reading you've done in the history of. This hey, stuff. heavy side is in the the cats cats well, from. Yeah, but uh, a lot of people don't know what his max his contribution was. <laughs> Maxwell gets all the press, but Maxwell's equations were the pits, and what heavy side basically did was straighten them out for Maxwell and made yeah. them. He reformulated Maxwell's equations to make them readable that we can actually use them. So the four equations mm -hmm. that you see, these are Maxwell's equations? No. Yeah. Maxwell had about 14 equations, which were not reconcilable. Heavy side did all the heavy work, actually, to do that. But here's, a, here's how we take them uh, through uh, uh, a dog and pony show. We do the uh, Great Eastern Telegraph, undersea telegraph table. Oh, wow. Table, 1858. You know, 1858. The Great Eastern was the largest ship of its time, had like five, six baths and whatever. Had a continuous... Um, uh, uh, three iron tanks with 2,300 nautical miles of cable wound on there. And not shielded played, cable. Not, well, yeah, well, <laughs> not shielded, but it was like, you know, hemp and all this other bullshit. Yeah. But anyway, so they laid the cable. The cable broke in three weeks afterwards. <laughs> it goes to show you. But and you could use a TDR to figure out where the break is. Yeah, you could have. But uh, so that was 1858. Then we had something called the Civil War. So in 1866, they got back oh, at wow. it again. Wow. They relayed up an improved cable. But what then they noticed was that they couldn't send information very quickly. It took just it took two minutes to transmit just one Morse character. That's because of the uh, the massive uh, impedance. I mean, uh, inductance and capacitance of the cable. Oh, you try to signal too velocity quickly. factors. That's right. Oh. You, you couldn't signal fast enough. Uh, uh, because the damn uh, uh, transients would go up and down. So yeah. it took two minutes to transmit one Morse character, right? But it was still a success because it was, it was a lot faster than the Pony Express across the ocean. So that was Cyrus Field's work. So anyway, oh, wow. that's, that's what a typical undergraduate course looked like uh, 12, 13 years ago. We, so, you know, the real question should be like for hams, what should hams know? I mean, really kind of know in the gut level about impedance. Well... Um, the telegrapher's equation, I think, are a good place to start because a lot of books don't start with that, but that really let, sets the entire tone for what's going on. But, uh, that's, that's, it is, as you say, it's a differential equation because what you do is you model a transmission line in parts, essentially. You take a little section here and you model a, a discrete summation of a transmission line. And the telegrapher's equations were uh, 
differential equations, uh, partial differential equations based on that. So to go through all of that bullshit. Well, that would that would that greatly limits the ham radio population to well, figure out what yeah, this we means. Do, um, we have, um, is is the analogy it. of Grampy and grandkid on a swing a good yeah, analogy that, for that's, residents? That's, absolutely, yeah. sure, absolutely. So anyway, that's that's what this looked like at the time. Yeah. All right, that's enough of that. I'll send you these slides anyway, or you can. I'll send you in PowerPoint form if you want to steal anything. I'm not teaching it anymore. I had to decide, uh, well, shortly in college, but whether I was interested in kind of the raw science, which I call, you know, the physics or astronomy, or more of the applications, the engineering. I uh, was interested in astronomy and worked at um, King of Prussia, the, what was then General Electric, uh, back in the 1965, maybe. And uh, all of their calculations were in pounds per square inch, all, you know, Fahrenheit, everything was, you know, English, British units. Um, and for NASA, everything had to be published in metric units. And the engineers were just awful. They complained and they said to their boss in this local, you know, group, just hire someone who understands. So I was hired <laughs> as the junior engineer. I was a sophomore in college. I was hired to convert all of their graphs and charts and tables to metric units. So pounds per square inch to mega newtons per square meter. And they used to kid me, you know, what's a mega newton? Um, so I, the whole summer, all I did was convert all their, you know, and had to do it carefully not to mess up a decimal point. But uh, I had access to the library there. So I took out a couple of books on uh, astronomy, uh, how stars work and, you know, fusion and all this. I thought, oh, this is way cool. And the engineers I worked with, I started to talk to them about this stuff, and they had no interest in that. And I thought, well, I guess it's not practical, but I want to learn more about stars. So I became an astronomer, not an engineer. But I came close. I could have gone either way. I love playing with electronics. But I, I thought. I started at GE in 78, uh, in and uh, they were still using every unit in the world, except maybe furlongs and fortnights, but they were feet, about uh, slugs. inches, how, how meters, about slugs? astronomical, huh? How about oh, slugs? slugs? Yeah, we had slugs. Got to have slugs. I always love slugs. Oh, slugs, yeah. Oh, my gosh, slugs. <laughs> and dynes, D-Y-N-E, yeah, yeah. Let's see. Uh, well, can, they, we, uh, can we unshare? And I just want to show one more thing, if I can share for a moment. Well, I, I guess I guess up Dennis, one yeah. point. The, that, that got so confusing, it was... It was one of the dominant sources of software errors in our uh, in our systems that we built was the 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 mismatch of units. Did this come up calibration? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. okay. So here it is, Dennis, right here. So in the calibration assistant, this is great because you have a little more control. I can put a number right here, and that has the effect of moving calibration plane. One feet away, 10 feet away, 100 feet away, as far as I want. I have to put in the right number, but not in feet of coax, but in picoseconds delay. So I can calibrate my nano VNA right at the nano VNA, go to this point in the calibration assistant, put in like, I'll just say 175,000 picoseconds, and I've just nulled out 175 feet of coax. And my Smith chart and everything else will show me what the values, values would be if I had this nano VNA right up at, at the antenna. And I thought, wow, that is really clever. Now, I'm correcting it in my shack. So what I really have to do is, you know, figure out what to do in my shack. But this tells me what's happening at the antenna through the software, I mean, through the programming. Hey, my SWR meter isn't that sharp to do that. <laughs> what's the name of that software? Nano VNA Saver, S-A-V-E-R. Uh, and that's out of... Uh... I just got it at a GitHub or something. I don't know. It's, I just I just Googled. Uh, what did I Google the first? But th there's three or four different applications. Most of them okay. are free. Um, this is one I liked right away. Uh, some others claim some others. Working with the same nano VNA gadgets uh, are a little better. I don't know. People oh, keep yeah. asking me, have you updated the software yet? I thought. It's working perfect for me right now. I don't want to mess with it because uh, 
I might make it a lot, <laughs> lot worse. I hate, you know, I hate to up, upgrade unless I have a reason to upgrade. I'm still learning about this little gadget. Um, so, yeah, here's mine. I mean, I didn't buy it. It was free, but I thought this really did. Whoops, this is my camera. So this is looking at my 20-meter antenna right now. Um, I just find it, for me, hard to use on the device itself. Uh, I have a hard time with bifocals reading it, you know, it's like, and, and uh, everything I do on the computer screen is just much easier. I'm always afraid I'm going to drop it. Jeremy showed us his. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So once you calibrate it and play with it, is the, is the, oh, so Jeremy, do you use Nano VNI Saver or do you use the software right on the gadget? I haven't done the software yet. I've just been using oh. it. So is that for you too? You have to have pretty good eyesight to read all the small print and poke the little things, and you have yeah. to keep going back to display change. You know, click, 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 click. The menu structure is like six trees deep. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, I'll probably like it a lot better once I get into the software. I, I quickly installed it, but it was having problems recognizing it, so I probably have to install some drivers or something. Oh, when I plugged mine, uh, well, you have to have the power on, mm -hmm. and I had a live you know, USB, as soon as I plugged it in, it paused and it said, you know, unknown device. And, you know, within one minute, it had downloaded and, you know, installed whatever the driver was for this particular one. Now, this isn't the one you have. This is, you know, you're old already. And uh, when I checked, you know, device manager said, oh, this is on port seven. So I went to, you know, the, the opening screen where it says connect. I said, all right, connect port seven, com, com seven. And everything worked right out of the bat. So uh, on Windows 10. But my computer is about seven years old. I don't know. I didn't have trouble with drivers or anything. Maybe I just didn't wait long enough. Well, and you have a physically a different one than I. If I were to buy one now, I'd probably buy the same one you did with a larger screen, an end connector, metal. metal this is a plastic case. Everything's cheap about it. But... Uh, you know, it, this is a nice solid aluminum case. Yeah, yeah. And the batteries in there are good for a couple hours, I think. Yeah, it was running for a while. I didn't have to recharge it. Yep. So got the, uh, the end connectors at the bottom. Yeah, and since I don't usually operate, you know, at 440 and above, the little SMA connectors and extra coax braids, they don't mean anything, you know. Yeah. I can ignore three feet of coax. Yeah. I just bought a couple of N to UHF connectors. Yeah, was, and that's sort of for for the U8 for like 440 that that kills it because yeah. the uh, the typical coax PL259s aren't 50 ohms at 400 megahertz. Yeah, I don't know. What, they call it a UHF connector, but it sucks on UHF. Right. So did you stop recording? Oh yeah, maybe I can. <laughs> I was going to say, we have to watch what we say now. Hey, does anyone else have any questions? I was going to say, my experience with it is a couple of years back, I tested the two meter side of my antenna using an MFJ, and it came out pretty well. It was like, it was less than two to one. So I'm like, oh, I'm happy with what that. What kind of antenna? The, the J pole. Oh, J poles are tricky, though, because you'll get RF back. Yeah. So I, I checked it on 440 just uh, this weekend, and it turns out that at the top of the band, I was getting up to almost three to one. Uh-oh. So what I ended up doing is I, I added an extra couple of loops in the coax. I choked up really close to the base of the antenna. Oh, that's the key. The guy who made the one I bought at Kimberton, and I said something about, oh, this is really interesting because it's made out of just, you know, plumber tubing, you know, half-inch tubing. Maybe it's the same one you have. And I said, how did you decide? Because you, you soldered on, a, you know, what do you call it? The SO239. You soldered that right on the copper very mm -hmm. nicely, too. I said, how did you decide how far up or down to go? He said, well, that's the trick because that's the impedance matching point. Mm -hmm. He said, if you go up or down a half an inch, you change, you know, the 50 ohm spot. But And he mentioned to me, uh, when you have your coax come out of that, put a choke on it and it'll work better. So I did that, and I got the top of the band down to like 2.3 to 1. Yeah. It's not ideal, but it's close enough. And the problem I have is the antenna is indoors. I have it mounted on a window. There's a lot oh, of... Oh, well, you've got surrounding objects that are part of your antenna. Yeah. yeah. 
What I should probably do is cut it down a little bit, but you know, this is half inch aluminum. I don't feel like cutting that. And I know those things are a real pain because you got three elements and when you cut one, you got to cut one of the others just the right amount. Oh, is this the elk? There's one that's like a two band, two, two meter 440 J pole. Yeah, arrowhead. arrowhead, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Hey. Well, it's easier to lower the frequency, put on a paper clip at the end. <laughs> so. Yeah, you can always you can always add more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Once you cut it, you can't. You get a nail file. <laughs> yeah. I got a little over two to one, so I figure that's good enough. I'll live with it. I would love to see a talk on uh, J pole antennas. We did. We had Ed Fong. Uh, back oh, yeah, here. I missed it. Yeah. It, isn't it archived, um, Jeremy? Yeah, you could find it on uh, YouTube. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I took the J pole down. I kind of set it up in the open, and sure enough, it's like one point one to one all the way across both bands. And it's just oh yeah, up, yeah. Uh, it messes it up. Yeah, I wonder. I wonder who told you to do that. Yeah. Ah. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, if you have a dipole that's let's say one wavelength long, okay, and you think well, that's one wavelength, but you feed it at the quarter wave point, so it's one side's a quarter wave and the other's three quarter wave. That will work. That's a f another fifty ohm match. One quarter wave, three quarter wave. Then you take the antenna and just fold it up. So you got one quarter here and three quarters here, and you have them close together, eh, pretty close. That's pretty critical too. So the part that's one quarter and one quarter, now it, it looks more like transmission line, right? Yeah. So it's like the old ZEP. So it looks like the ZEP, uh, what do you call it, NFED antenna. Well, you might say it is a ZEP NFED antenna. The problem is you're just trying to match it to 50 ohm coax. That's the problem. Well, it's sort of like a, a gamma match, right? You're just picking the point where you want to feed it. Yeah. And that's more art than science. Yeah. Well, or you do it the scientific way. You put it one place, and if it doesn't work, you put it someplace else. Yeah, yeah. Keep moving it till it works. And so that, that was my fun with it. So I'm glad I found that out. Because my radio probably starts to complain at about three to one. So I was probably just below that. But it's only the very top. It's like a, maybe around 448 to 450 is where it starts. Did you test the antennas in your car? I haven't done that yet. That'll be my project yeah. for next week. I, yeah, I just got a new car last year. I haven't checked them. Ooh. Good metal roof. <laughs> well, I have it mounted on the hood, on a, a trunk. On lift. the hood, yeah. It'll be interesting to see how that comes out. Well, this was fun. I took a chance. <laughs> yeah, no, it was good. <laughs> Are there other questions? All right, then we'll uh, adjourn the meeting. If anyone wants to hang around to chat, you can, but I will uh, shut down uh, YouTube and I will 